People born in Lincolnshire. Right. <laughs> and, and what sort of explanation of where the, the uh, phrase comes from? Is it a ceremonial sash from the uh, Lincolnshire Regiment? Yes, because yep. they, yes, they had well, they had ceremonial yellow waistcoats. And I've heard that story. So shall we stick with that one? It's from the Lincolnshire Regiment uh, old youth, which included yellow. Um, there are other explanations, I'm told. We'll stick with that. The, the ones that Yorkshire people spread around are not usually that reliable. <laughs> 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 right. So, well, there's various reasons for starch, but the first reason is that half my job is going to be the summer. My job to well is in fact, the cathedral, like all um, cathedrals, or even all churches, have been through a very bad time. Because we do rely um, to keep a place where the people are visiting us. And without fear, really think of yourself, don't think of yourself as visitors, please. So the pilgrims, who even in the Middle Ages, paid something to come to the various shrines. So thank you. Um, the reason to start at this West End is we're a Norman foundation. Okay, so it's William the Conqueror who ordered his bishop in, Link, in the diocese to build a cathedral in Lincoln. Um, he did that because it was a Roman city and still had its walls around it, up here. Um, and so the cathedral was built in the southeast quarter of the city of Lincoln, with its walls protected by its walls. And bearing in mind, not everybody welcomed William the Conqueror, and particularly in this Anglo-Saxon, Danish part of the world. So he built it to be protected by the Lord. And um, he also ordered the castle to be built a bit earlier than um, the cathedral. So the cathedral is dated from 1072. And the castle over there in the southwest quarter, on slightly higher ground in the mountains, he got first dig in 1068. Uh, and uh, the cathedral got their own back, of course, by built they, they got lower ground and built a tall building. It all worked. Um, in 1072, uh, he, he appointed a bishop, a friend of his, or his cousin maybe, who'd been with him at Hastings and had given one ship and several knights and other troops. And he was present at the Battle of Hastings. Uh, so that was a guy called Religious, who was a French man, a very experienced administrator in the monastery. And he was made the first Norman appointed bishop in, in, in the land. Uh, and his cathedral was down in Dorchester on Thames. Because we, it was a huge diocese. It still is a large diocese. So it was, it was a tiny little church, really, uh, at Dorchester. And uh, so he was able to build a, a, a big cathedral here. And that's why they got moved. And they still have in our archives apartment on, on which the instruction to the bishop is written and various witnesses. Actually William's name didn't, doesn't appear. He would never have personally written because it would have been scribes from uh, whatever his administrative uh, civil service was. Uh, but uh, it's in our archives and instructs the bishop to get him some money and build a cathedral. And this is where he was to put it. So, the thing is, we're not really going to, there's a lot, there is some Norman stuff still around, but it's behind, it's at this west end, and it's behind all this relatively new looking stonework. So this stonework is dated from about the 1700s, 1750-ish, plus or minus, and it's to hold up this end of the cathedral, which has been falling down for centuries. <laughs> and to some extent still is. Have you, did you come in and see the towers leaning out? Mm -hmm. okay, it's not an optical illusion, it's real. There's about a five degree difference, which is quite a lot when you're talking about tall towers. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so this is part of the work done to try and stabilise things in 1750. Further work, a lot of extra works had to be done since then. And so uh, really within the cathedral, we're not going to, going to see basically our second 
if you want to see the Norman remains of the cathedral, you have to do either go out, just go outside and look back at this west front, and you see quite clearly some plain stone, which is the Norman west front, but it's surrounded by a very ornate Gothic extension to the west. But it, when you look at it, I've told you that, there's no mistaking where the Norman stone is. It was quite a bit. And you can find, for example, this large here, the Norman. And that actually within the cathedral, that's the only Norman thing you see, unless you go through that door there. <laughs> um, and go on a room tour. And that takes you inside here, and it goes up into the room above the nave. And you go inside this building, well, you see quite a lot of Norman stuff behind all the stuff. So um, with that in mind, we'll turn around and we'll have a look at the rest of the cathedral, which is what we're actually going to do. Second cathedral, which is what we're looking at. And it's a Gothic cathedral, i.e., the, the era of Gothic architecture started um, about a hundred years after the cathedral was founded. And we'll come to why we've got a Gothic cathedral really rather than a Norman one. Um, I mean, there are cathedrals around with masses of Norman stuff inside them, and, but we're not one of them, unfortunately, although we were, you know, we were founded at the same time as a lot of them. So um, we're looking at the, well, the first thing to say about the Gothic architect is they, they developed the pointed arch, which meant they could have rather more slender pillars reaching out much taller, and they could let the light in from the clear story that they wanted at the top, which reflected off the other, another of the inventions of the Gothic architect, which is this, um, the, the uh, old so the first cathedral that got built didn't have had those in all this. Um, it would have just had wooden rafters and you'd have looked up into the roof. Um, but the, the Gothic architect invented this sort of thing. It's not structural. It's really um, cosmetic, if you like. It's decorative. Um, and it's also a fire Because above there, the stone stops and they're into a territory of wood. Um, so the stone is all down at this point. And if you look up to it, does it remind you possibly of a, a hull of an upturned ship mm -hmm. on the shore? So that is why this area is called, well, that they put, I've got it slightly the wrong way around. This area is called the nave, which comes from the Latin naves, which means the ship. Mm -hmm. And obviously, very obviously, we get our word navy from that from navigator. Um, and the nave is the same idea. Um, symbolically, we just come into Noah's Ark saves us from the fire and the flood and carries us through the ice. So that was the symbolism of this area of the cathedral. It was always open to the public to come and, and not necessarily to worship, although one of the things we're missing is a lot of the little chantry altars down each side of the nave, where mass would have been said every day by some priests and all the incense. I mean, we are missing quite a lot of the sort of religious life and colour of a medieval cathedral nowadays. Uh, mass would have been said 30 or 40 times a day. Nevertheless, we still have communion services every day of the year, without exception, um, in, in the cathedral. And even when it was completely closed, some worship went on every day. So but anyway, this is the name, and that's what it's about. And they, 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 taking that in mind, that's why they built this, or uh, put in this decorative um, uh, vault. That was the idea. Just go to that corner there by the door and look down the whole length of the cathedral because that's the best internal view really of the length of that. Yeah, need a tour tayo nung ano dito sa simbahan. Nilwanag niya yung uh, history ng simbahan. Oh, I'm going to Lincoln Cathedral, which is quite right, but it hasn't always been 
Tour na tayo ni Benjamin. It's a typical Tournay font, as it's this. But, and one of the things they, they did at that firm font is they used to decorate the outside of their font. And we've got here um, the griffins of dragons fighting amongst themselves all the way around the edge. And again, the symbolism is pretty obvious, and it's something that happens quite a lot in um, this cathedral and probably most others. The difference between good and evil or between um, what's going on in the world, what we need protecting from, and what's going to protect you. So the protection comes from the holy water, which is in the pond. You admit it into the church. Um, and this is all the stuff going on in the world. And that's a theme of much of the carving and the symbolism. As, as in fact, you know, coming into Noah's Ark outside of the symbol. So fonts are nearly always at the West End of the church. This font came to us in 1120, um, but it's still in use today, and now we come to the bit where, um, this is why I've stopped you here, um, my children were baptised. So, um, you know, just think, I wonder how many other people have been baptised. Going back um, 800 years ago, or the I can't do this up, can um, Yes, oh, what a good question. The question is, what does this font make? Um, it's made of Tournay marble, 
but it's not marble. Well, no, 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 no. It's called Tournay marble, but it's a limestone, polished up to look a bit like marble. Um, another thing about this font is they used to come in bits and were assembled on site. So that's rather a modern concept. And can you see somewhere along the line they dropped this slab because uh, can you see there's a crack? The crack runs all the way around, but there's a lead lining, so it holds it all. the font made of, um, we're built out of locally quarried limestone. Um, and like limestone, it, well all limestone is a sort of sedimentary rock that's been formed over millions of years um, by stuff sinking down to the bottom of these warm Jurassic seas and forming a rock. And they most limestone, not all I guess, contains fossils. Lincoln Seed is no exception, and I've stopped us here just because this particular site, I mean, you can find them everywhere, you don't have to look here, but look here, look here, look at all these fossils on the right limestone floor. So, you know, 180 million years ago, these two little fellows here were actually swimming around, <laughs> um, and probably never thought one day they would be part of Lincoln Seed. But that's what we're made of. The other stone is decorative, so the structure is made of limestone, but there's quite a lot of decorative um, uh, Purbeck marble, which comes from the Isle of Purbeck down in Dorset. And um, it, it, it's, it's um, a black stone and it's polished up. It's called marble again because they polish, up, polish it up to look like marble. And when it's new, it's really almost black. And the limestone is normally very, very pale. So, but as the two weather, they tend to merge into a muddy grey. But where can we find them? Um, well, actually, in a way, this pillar shows it quite well. This is perfect marble. And it's really only there for the decoration. And this is the limestone, which is the structural element. Um, so, and it does show up to a point, and can you imagine when the cathedral was new, it would be almost a contrast between black and white. Mm. And it would have been all around us. We are missing um, in today's cathedral quite a lot of the colour that was around. To some extent it's been replaced by the windows, but the, the painting that would have been all up in this sort of level, and the, the bright contrast between perfect marble and limestone has been lost. We don't do a lot about the windows in the nave. They're all Victorian, they're not ever so old. But we do we tend to mention this window here, which is called our teaching window, um, and was put because and the theme is um, Christ being taught or teaching at various locations. Um, but it was put there by the widow of George Boone. Um, I don't know whether the name Boone rings any bell for you, but he's the guy who invented what is now Boolean algebra, Boolean algebra, and, and it's what, it's a sort of algebra that's used to design electronic chips, so, or, or the algorithms in that are used to design electronic chips, so all computers, you know, cameras, phones, the sort of, the design of them can be traced back to George Ball, he was a local schoolmaster. Um, and he didn't go to university, but he was um, obviously quite a brilliant guy. Um, he did in the, in the end become a professor of mathematics at Cork University in Ireland, because no British university had been born. But by then he'd become very famous in the world of mathematics. So mm. he died in 1834, no, sorry, 1854. And um, the father of computers. Again, he probably, it was a purely theoretical thing. I don't think he probably had any concept of what it was going to lead to. Uh, but that was in, in memory of him. You can see that in the memory of George Ball. 
15 of them along the walls of the nave. Um, they are um, called the forest stations, and they are actually works of art rather than religious works, um, but they are based on the stations of the cross. Um, but as you notice, I've said 15 in, in, in liturgical practice, there's only 14 stations of the cross. Um, they've been around many, many cathedrals in the UK. Uh, they were carved by um, a furniture maker who was very worried about trees um, becoming extinct and uh, just being cut down. There were lots of trees and forests around the world. So he was used in these 139, wood from 139 different trees from all over the world. And there used to be a very nice sort of uh, guide, a, a, a sort of a plan with a note with each wood that it was so you could look up anything you particularly wanted. That seems to have gone with the pandemic. So um, no doubt at some stage it will come back. You can buy a book about them if you're very interested. But you are allowed to go up to them. And um, it used to, I mean, at the height of the pandemic, you weren't really allowed to touch them. But I think you would be allowed to actually touch them now, if you wish. And um, they start, the station number one is there and then they go around. Station number 15 um, is that one there, um, which is the only one which is a single piece of wood, um, and it's elm from England. And of course, you know, elm, I think he, he, he carved these or made them in the 1990s sometime. Um, and um, elm was on its way out as a tree, really, didn't it, with elm disease? But that's uh, a single piece of elm. Right at the top, at that, the west end, is a load of people in front of that rose window. So uh, this is this is a, a, a short intermission for various adverts or an advert. That they're on the roof. So if anyone wants to ever come back to the people who on a roof tour, that's one of the places you get. To. It's just a fantastic view. The guy in the window is a Victorian's depiction of Bishop Remigius, who is the founding bishop of this country. Um, well, we stop. Oh, actually, we may as well say this now. Um, the reason why we have a um, Gothic cathedral, not a Norman one, is uh, can be explained, uh, or it can be um, signalled, signalled by looking at this midline of the left. You look along as far as that. You see that it's a little bit of faint speech in the roof. And if, if, that, if you don't sort of, if you think, oh, that's not a very big key, well, that's true. Um, look at the, the, you can see the whole thing doesn't fit symmetrically onto the west end. And the reason for this is that, and why we've got the Gothic Cathedral in 1185, so roughly a hundred years after the cathedral was founded, uh, there was an earthquake in Lincoln and the, the Norman Cathedral collapsed. Apart from the West End, which was very solidly built, and people say, and that was the first bit of the Norman Cathedral to be built, actually, and people say it was built as a fortress. Again, it was being built during revolutionary time when it wasn't actually clear that the bishop could safely live in Lincoln. So they think they built that as a sort of a, a refuge for the bishop and his camels. That's why it withstood the earthquake. 
So when they rebuilt, they started the rebuild at the east end, so they could build a high altar, then you could have high mass and various other services. And they took about 40 or 50 years to get from the east end to the west. And when they got there, of course, they found it didn't join them. <laughs> It's not too bad, though, isn't it? Yes, so actually, isn't it, the, the, the comment here is that that's not too bad. And I think I, they started up here. Yes, they did start yeah, up here. Yes, it's apparently, I don't think it's going to look it to me, but I'm yeah. told it's yeah. a It's a bit exposed. Well, the first thing to say is that. that, that, that they got there in about the year 11, uh, 1240, having started in um, about 1190. Yeah. And so, well, firstly, they had 50 years to know that. You know, I know that you say they're not out by much, but should they have been out by anything? Where do you start? And, but the other thing is, from, from that time to this, it stood up. Yeah. So it's not that bad. They didn't have the benefit of the equipment we've got today. They did certainly not have lasers, no. <laughs> but what I would say is that um, they were, you know, I mean, you just got to look around, but anyone say they weren't good buildings, you know, they were really? fantastic. They won't believe so there are various, there are various reasons why that might be like that. Um, the one I prefer, because it sort of seems about right, is that they were going to demolish that West End because it was normal, and they wanted to build it in the new. Um, Gothic style, like Salisbury Cathedral, um, and um, they ran out of money, <laughs> and they had to suddenly, at the last minute, change the specs and tell whoever was building it to join A to B, and not to just keep on extending and making. It. And that's sort of got a real truth about it. But you can make up your own minds. But in, in history, nothing is absolutely right. Um, Good. That's um, just, just a word about where we're standing. Oh, incidentally, have it, this battle's written, um, the Sunday series battle's written on Sunday. If any of you have come or wanted to see the RAF chapel in particular, um, the service chapel is there. To that door. And the RAF chapel is right at the end. We don't go in there as a tour, but there's quite a lot of information on laminated sheets in there, and you're very welcome to go in. But I would say, I think they close the chapels at four, so um, you may need to, if, if you are interested in going and looking at the chapels, you probably need to peel off from the tour and uh, rejoin us later. Right, so um, we're laid out in the form of a cross, like most medieval cathedrals, and here we are um, standing where the arms of the cross are. So these are the great transepts, and they are enormous for cathedral transepts. Um, and we're, we're your, your lucky tour in that this the north transept here used until a few weeks ago was full of tables, chairs and all sorts. It was used as a storeroom basically. And, and now they've emptied it out um, because the cathedral shop has moved to where it is. Um, and the, what was the cathedral shop has been taken over as a storeroom. So you're one of the first to actually see this um, wonderful north transept as it should be. Um, and the, the, the things to note are these two great rose windows. Um, Starting with the, this rose window to the north, that is the Dean's Eye. Um, and the, 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 the old medieval deanery was to the north of the cathedral. And that is the Dean's ceremonial entrance, that window. And the Dean's Eye window was built in uh, 1220. And that is what got built with its more or less all of it is the original 1220 glass in its original position. And if we'd been pilgrims in 1250, and they just got joined the nave onto the west front, um, that is what we'd be looking at. So there's not many things in the cathedral you could really say that. Um, it, the, the stonework has had to be replaced. It's been replaced in its original pattern. Um, and that was done in the 1990s, a huge project, as you can imagine. But the glass was taken out, cleaned and preserved, and put back in its original position. So that is the Dean's Eye. Now, if you would turn around, you can see the Bishop's Eye. Um, the Bishop always lived to the south of the cathedral. Um, obviously, that was a sunnier spot. Um, and um, the Bishop's Ceremonial Entrance is the Galilee Porch, which is that entrance there. 
and so that is the bishop's eye and that was like the dean's eye but that wall collapsed about a hundred years after it was built so you're looking at a change of architectural style of about a hundred years and that's much more florid and is late gothic and the dean's eye is fairly early gothic and the glass there a lot of it is the old original glass but they couldn't put it back in the same pattern and if you take a photograph of it do enlarge it when you get home and see if you can pick out various bits of figure um, angel's wings a foot here a head there a crown a bit of wood. it's all there but it's in a random kaleidoscopic pattern so i mean we think it's very beautiful um, but and so it is uh, but, and it's quite a puzzle Um, this would be as far as the ordinary public if we weren't ordained priests or choir boys could go in medieval time. So that is through to the choir. Um, we do go in there now, but not through this entrance. Um, and this is the choir screen. It was built, we think, by the same stonemasons that uh, built, rebuilt that wall because, again, it's a very floridly decorated uh, screen. Uh, so it's decorated Gothic style, built in about 1330. Um, before that, there was what was called a wooden rood screen with a huge wooden cross above it. Um, I've really stopped us here to show you that there is a bit of colour left in the cathedral. Um, and this is medieval colouring. And it, it, it was some reds here, reds, blues, there are girls. And this was once totally coloured. But it all got scraped off on the borders of James I when he became king, because he didn't like colour in churches. So it, and apparently the whole place got painted in a rather gloomy green colour. But at least they got rid of that. <laughs> Um, we're going into um, the choir area now, what the park called the choir, and this will be the earliest bit of Gothic. Unfortunately, it would be wonderful if we could say Norman, early Gothic, middle Gothic, late Gothic. It doesn't work quite like that. The name is middle Gothic. Um, what we're going into is the earliest Gothic, and then right at the end we get the latest decorated Gothic. In what's going to be in the choir. We'll come to that. Um, so this is the South Choir entrance. South Choir aisle entrance. But again, it's, again, it shows you quite nicely the contrast between this is new-ish pervert marble and limestone. And again, you, it, it's just to show you the symbolism of the various carvings that there are around. Um, here we've got these dragons. And this is line is um, fine leaf tracery and you see there's various grapes hanging from this these vines and there's a dragon eating the grapes which isn't right at all mm -hmm. uh, they're not allowed to eat grapes and so here we have the problem being dealt with um, these these carvings turn up in books of medieval sculpture here the soldiers um, killing the dragons by thrusting the swords right down there Gullets. and then just like even today you hang moles out along a, a fence line here all the dragons hanging upside down um, dead as dodos and that should be that problem over but the, whoever did this has put two little owls in. Mm. and the owl in medieval times was not a, a nice cuddly little animal that we would like to have in our cots and so on. He's a, he was a, a, an ignorant animal, but also a fearful animal who didn't bring anything good. He only flew around at night. And even now, I think if you walk through a wooded area, you know, away, you know, away from all civilization, if you hear the owl hooting, I do believe it, but you, you feel something a bit nervous going on. I do anyway. So the, the idea is that you think you've dealt with life's problems, but you have to be very careful. There's always something you must watch out for. That is how we interpret these owls. There are various other interpretations of them, but none of them are good, I should say. <laughs> 
that we've lost all of our brass. Um, Cromwell invaded, well, Crom the Earl of Manchester invaded Lincoln during the Civil War with his troops and stationed them with horses in the cathedral um, and ripped up all the brass to be melted down and turned into weapons. So uh, we've got no, anything brass in the cathedral dates um, post-restoration of the monarchy. So that would be late 17th century on and as we stopped here, um, this is known as our apprentice book. Did you notice the rows of the Blessed Virgin Mary on the choir screen as the background? Mm -hmm. and, we, and, and this is a similar idea. These are, the, these are roses, we think. Each one is a bit different. And they're big, they, you know, they're like Duplo as opposed to Lego. <laughs> and we think, I mean, this is, there's absolutely no proof that these were done by apprentices. But it's a non-structural wall, so we've called it our apprentice wall. And um, you can sort of think, well, maybe it was a test piece. If it was a piece all right, you've got to put it in there. Oh. Uh, it's not all apprentices stuck exactly to the wall. It's amazing. There's one here in the um, nest. The fledgling's in, and um, someone else, or maybe the same guy, has done a bird taking a worm to the nest. And, <laughs> and they're quite Exactly the faces upside down, hoping that no one would notice. <laughs> and indeed they wouldn't um, until some busybody guy comes round and gets <laughs> This is our choir, um, and it is the first bit of the cathedral that got built after the earthquake. So this, this, this choir would be dated from about 1190, and it's quite early Gothic, and it's not as light as the rest of the cathedral, because you know they're, they're only just experimenting with the larger windows and letting the light in. Um, and another thing they were experimenting with was the vaulting. So if you look up at this vaulting. Um, that's unique in the world. Um, it's Lincoln's crazy vaulting. <laughs> um, and it, it, it's not, it's, it, I don't, I used to say it's not symmetrical, but actually it, in its way there is a symmetry there. And um, it's a, somewhat odd. Um, and if you can imagine they were trapped, they were building from east, which is where we are, to west. Um, it's when they get to that point, they decide, well, let's actually make it obviously symmetrical. They think it looks better. Now, I wonder whether it does look better, because if, if the people have argued about what, what was the original plan, and if it was to um, make this wall to go all the way down the nave, then actually it might have had quite a, uh, a moving effect. It might have almost given it movement rather than static stones as you look along. But we will never know, of course. So um, vaulting is now the symmetrical pattern. And then looking straight up, you see this young thing. And we'll come to that, but that's quite obviously a different year, isn't yeah. it? And as a, as it's a, uh, it's a slowly they knock something down and just tap something on. What do we do about that? And we'll come to that when we get to the end of choir. And so this is our choir. 
um, I think it's being prepared for evening song because I think tonight, or maybe it's tomorrow, they're um, installing the new clerk of works, which will be quite a special. I mean, normally all the sun services are held in the choir, but since the pandemic, to keep the congregation more separated, um, they've all taken place in the night. But I think maybe today they're going to be here. Um, this is known as St. Hugh's Choir because Hugh of Avalon was the bishop appointed by Henry II to rebuild the cathedral. So um, he uh, was quickly made a saint when he died in the year 1200. He never saw his cathedral completed, but he did see the choir here completed. So it's known as St. Hugh's Choir. And the canons of the cathedral, of whom we've got 52 or 3 now, um, all sit in the canon stalls around here, and the choir are there, and there, and they process in here. And um, various uh, senior clergy have their own, well, all the canons have their own stall, but some stalls are um, always set aside for whoever is in post, so the bishops in our cathedral is there, and that's why we are a cathedral. Um, if you don't have a cathedral, no matter how big you are as a church, you're not a cathedral. And on the other hand, in Wales, there are some very small churches that are cathedrals because um, they still have their cathedral, which is where the bishop sits. Um, the dean, who's the senior priest in this church, um, not the bishop, um, the dean sits there, the sub-dean sits next to her. That stall is always reserved for the centre. He's in charge of the music. Um, and the Chancellor, who's in charge of all the sort of education things that go on in the cathedral, always sits there. And the, uh, the Lord Lieutenant sits in the stall of the Logan Regis, which means standing in the front. Um, this, 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 um, the original Norman church came to an end about where we were standing. And that is because it was built in the Roman city, but Hugh got permission to knock through the walls of the city and build a longer cathedral which extended outside the city boundary. And the Roman walls, was, you can't see it, but it's down there, about a foot down, under the altar rail. So just when you're looking at the east wall of the Roman city. for something. It's not always known what it is, but the dean of the new was at the end of the cathedral that he built that he said. That was a half a year ago. And he got the thing from this point down to the west end. Um, and uh, it's rather a, a sort of a, a semicircle effect in a way. So this is very friendly, and um, most of the cathedrals in France have east ends on that pattern. Um, and um, of course he was a French monk, 
I was I'm really thinking the thinking of the year sort of um, 1200, which is when he died actually. But then the French were still the big influence. And, and from drawing such a thing, they reconstructed it. Was the most beautiful East End of the cathedral. However, when he died in 1200, he was buried um, within the cathedral, but in a little chapel over there. It's quite a small one, which is actually partly being demolished. And if you go around there on the outside, you often see a little bunch of flowers on the point where his grave was. Um, it wasn't outside, it was in, in, in the So many pilgrims came to worship at that shrine that they thought they needed a big build as a shrine. But strangely, they knocked down half of what he would build in order to build the shrine. So that is why you get from that point to where we're standing now, all got demolished. And they built this. Now, I'm not saying this is a magic place, but this is the most beautiful place. And the amount of glass in, in the morning, you know, that's direct east. The light flooding through that green east window is just wonderful. But it is strange in a way that they made a shrine by knocking down perhaps the most beautiful bit of his cathedral. Um, and his body was moved to just behind the high altar. So there was a huge shrine here. Again, we have a shrine. And it wasn't just a little sort of old or, or, um, memorial, it was more of, of, of that sort, I mean it wasn't that, but it was that type of large construction. And when they moved his body, his head had become detached already from the rest of the skeleton. So they built a head <laughs> His head was on the top of that in a, 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 a relic room. Um, and Henry VIII, when he visited Lincoln, saw this casket and thought it looked very valuable because apparently it was gold and encrusted with jewels. And it was probably valuable. And he thought it should be looked after down in London. And that, of course, needed to say the last machine of either the casket or St. Hugh's Bank. But um, it, was a, it was a place where a lot of pilgrims came to. When pilgrims came to Lincoln in the Middle Ages, they did pay something to come to these two shrines. A lot of people came in their thousands. So uh, that's what the shrines were doing. And, and as part of the memorial in the year 2000, as well as being the millennium, um, don't anybody tell me it wasn't the millennium, it's too complicated. <laughs> uh, but 2000 was the anniversary of his death. Um, this was, this uh, priest was commissioned. And you may say uh, that doesn't quite fit in, but the guy who uh, um, constructed it was a jeweller by trade and he was asked, he was instructed to do nothing or ever to touch the actual shrine itself. And he got his, um, his ideas from the illuminated manuscripts in our library, uh, which are obviously going to be so he surrounded it by the front and um, then we've reached out to join it. Um, and actually, someone on a previous tour pointed out to me something which may be relevant, although you, you, I've never seen this written down, but if you stand in front of it, and actually it's, it makes the letter H if you're looking directly at it. So maybe he was thinking of making a secret H in the Now then, um, anyone been to the castle? Yeah. See the line of inks? Yes. So you didn't realise they come from the cathedral, do you? Well, not the link, not the statue, but the ink refers to one of our cards. If we are now about to see, most people who come to the cathedral, they want to know where the rooms are at the coffee shop, and thirdly, where the ink is. <laughs> <laughs> this is it. <laughs>
from the twelve bridge and the angels playing musical instruments. That's how we get our names. There's a choir now singing. And the imp sing and they all come dancing down here and put up there. And the imp is a sunny stage cast that was probably done in sight in the world of the Um, but from a single block. 
um, is coloured. Um, I think the colouring is partly a reference to all the colour that we've lost. But uh, she's covered, it's all natural people. And the blue is the outside. And it's all, um, it, 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 it's, a, it's a, I think apparently a very typical icon pattern um, called the Lady of the Sign. So it's a blessed Virgin Mary holding Christ. Um, the, the, the sense of every piece of it is symbolic of something. Um, the Christ is sitting in this um, uh, almond type shape. I don't know whether you can remember looking at the bishop's eye, but that tracery was based on the, the um, mound or lime leaf tracery. It's and it's actually, the, among many things, it's the shape of our matrix seal from the 11th century, so from the 10 hundreds, actually. The, uh, the Diocese of Lincoln's matrix seal, which was used to seal doctrine. Um, and that's still um, in, our, uh, in our library. In our archives. Um, and the, 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 the pattern, all, all the cloak and everything, it's very reminiscent of the Romanesque carving, which of course is our, uh, the Romanesque period is our foundation period. Um, and Christ is so, uh, portrayed obviously as an infant in size, but a man in his architectural room. And he's looking at us as we're standing here. But actually as we're standing here, uh, the Mary is not looking at us. Or does anyone think she is? She's <laughs> looking down here. Yes, well, well spotted. And there's that the installation of the artist um, and a short speech and she's something focused for the days just beyond the front where we are coming from. So actually, when I got you on that corner looking down, she was looking at us there, following us through. And she designed to give us And that, I think, is uh, probably the nicest thing we can spot at all. Right, so then the question is between 12. Um, so the official tour is finished, and thank you all very much for coming. Mm -hmm. Those who want to stay, those of you who are going to sit down on a long aeroplane flight, you're going to talk forever. Well, you might get fed up with my well, snoring no, on the road. <laughs> 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 the, the two of them that we've got here is just kind of looks like a good size age. And then uh, some of the things that we do is with the other Yes, actually. Uh, the, the story of Eleanor is um, she was married to Edward the First, and I say was married, you know, it was a political decision, and they were teenagers at the time and didn't even speak each other's language. Um, but nevertheless, the marriage was very successful in all respects, and they were deeply in love, it is said, and they had 16 children. Um, and she accompanied him wherever he went, like on crusades and up to Scotland for the Scottish wars and so on. And when she died, he was heartbroken. So he died actually quite near in Harvey, which is a little village. And her body uh, was taken to a, a priory down at the bottom of St. Catherine. Yes. St. Catherine, exactly. When this morning. Did you? Yes. There's nothing at the priory left. No. But interestingly, the hill going up there's a hill going up from this spot um, onto the ridge again after the, across the river with them. That's called Cross and Cliff Hill. And the point is, wherever they took her body down to London, wherever they stopped, which was at 12 points, they had to, they didn't have to, they built um, or commissioned to build uh, a cross, an enormous structure, and costing millions of pounds each. So these are the Eleanor Crosses. Um, we, there's a fragment of Lincoln's only in the castle. I don't know if you saw it, but um, mostly they've all gone. Charing Cross. Charing Cross. Charing Cross. <laughs> well, Charing Cross, interestingly, is a reproduction of the original. Um, apparently, um, Walton, Cross, Hardingstone and Geddington. Was it one? Hardingstone and Geddington in the middle of the three because it's in very good condition, the one at the Charing Cross. Yeah, it's been reconditioned. It's been reconditioned. Yeah, it's been reconditioned. Yeah.
But that shows you what it's like. Not a little thing, is it? It's enormous. Nice. Thing. Nice. And of course, that's just before. She's buried in Westminster Abbey, her body. Yes. Now, when her body was prepared, the, her internal organs were removed, and they were buried in Lincoln Cathedral. Um, just sort of more or less in the centre of this. She'd been present in 1280 in this area in um, um, with, with a, they'd attended the service and they'd, um, did the service of dedication. And when she died, her funeral was held in Lincoln Cathedral and her internal organs just behind her. Not quite under this tomb, but this is the tomb. Now, the original tomb is that pattern. And it's the same um, pattern as uh, where she's buried in Westminster Abbey, but it was destroyed by Cromwell. Right. So that's, been, that, that's a new memorial. But her internal organs are there, apart from her heart, which was taken with her down to London and buried next to one of her sons who previously died um, in Blackfriars. Mm. Well, well, the organs are here, the rest of the body is in Western Australia, except her heart. Oh, Blackfriars? Yes, there was a monastery in Blackfriars. Is it still there? No, no. And so I don't think I to know exactly the spot where no. her heart was. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.